Well, I wanted to start our time this morning with a story. This is the story. You may have heard it before. If you're one of those people who's fascinated by warfare and war history and that kind of thing, you may have heard this story. This is the story of the 1914 Christmas truce. The Christmas truce. It was the first year of the Great War, World War I. And there was already fighting raging across Europe. And on Christmas Eve, armies just stopped fighting. This wasn't planned. This wasn't arranged. This wasn't the kind of ceasefires you see going on around the world in the wars that are raging today. This was spontaneous, unexpected. Now, in World War I, there was trench warfare. So you had these trenches dug out with the armies in this massive space between called no man's land. And it's called no man's land because if you went into it, you were dead. But one British soldier describes what happened. He says, we heard a German singing, O Holy Night, in German, of course. Then after he'd finished singing, there were all sorts of Christmas greetings being shouted across no man's land. The Germans shouted out, why don't you guys sing O Holy Night? Well, we had a go of it, but of course we weren't very good at that. But then they said, come over, meet us. So they did. People got out of the trenches, walked across no man's land, and fellowshiped. They shared gifts with one another. They sang Christmas songs together. They shared a meal together. You can look this up. There's pictures online. This, this, this happened. This is totally unexpected. See, when World War I started, nobody knew that it was going to be World War I. Nobody knew that it was going to be the Great War. Everyone thought they'd be home by Christmas. And so around Christmas time, the spirit of hope that the war would be short and come to a close quickly resulted in this moment of peace and harmony. But it was short-lived. When the high commands of both armies found that this was happening, and I'm not saying this was happening in one place. This happened all around Europe. But once they heard it was happening, they ordered everyone back to the trenches. A couple days later, they're all shooting and killing each other again. War went on for four more years. There were no more Christmas truces. This never happened again. But for a moment, in the midst of, in the midst of what would be maybe the greatest, most terrible war that anyone had known up till that point, there was peace, there was joy, there was hope. The Christmas truce. Why start with this story? Well, I just read the book of Jude to you, the letter of Jude. We're going to be studying that for uh, the next little while. Jude is a powerful little letter with a simple but uncomfortable message. We are to contend for the faith. Contend for the faith. Now, why study Jude now? Jude is known as the most neglected book in the New Testament. You're not going to find many sermon series on Jude out there. And in our church, times are good. If you were at the members meeting in January, Tom said, we seem to be experiencing a season of God's mercy and grace. There's unity. There's growth. Ministries are maturing. We have a vision for the future. So, it, times are good. It's going well. Why turn to Jude? I mean, I just read it, and as I read it, the, the, the tone in the room got more and more sober. Why turn to this tiny letter? Because, friends, we need to remember that we are still at war. When the church thrives, Satan rages. He does not rest. He does not stop. He does not declare a Christmas truce. He wants nothing more than to see this period of grace followed by the disasters of disunity and discord. Now, we aren't studying Jude because the elders think there's false teachers in the church. We aren't studying Jude because we want to start a heretic hunt. We aren't studying Jude because we're scared. We're studying Jude because the battle wages on and you and I need to be equipped. Contending for the faith isn't optional. It's a duty. 
It's an act of Christian faithfulness and obedience. Today we're going to look at the first four verses of Jude, the introduction. The title of the sermon is, O Church, Contend, Fight, Be Equipped for Battle. What we're going to try to do is answer two questions. First, what is contending for the faith? When we say, O Church, Contend, what do we mean? And second, the second question we're going to answer is, why must we contend for the faith? Why is it important that we take on this task? So let's answer the first question. What is contending for the faith? Look with me at verse 3 of Jude. Jude writes, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. If you've got a pencil, a pen, a highlighter, contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. That should be underlined, circled, starred, highlighted, whatever you do. This is the purpose statement for the whole letter. Jude wrote this letter because he wants us, he wants his readers to contend. Now what does contend mean? Cont- to contend is to struggle to overcome an opponent. To struggle to overcome an opponent. It, it originally comes from the athletic world, right? Athletic competitions, and specifically from the wrestling match. Imagine a wrestling match. You have two men that are battling against each other. It's, it's, it's a constant game. There's no breaks, right? And they're trying to get the upper hand. They're trying to subdue their opponent. There's no breaks. There's no rest. It's a constant exertion of, en- of energy until someone loses and someone wins. When Jude says contend, that's what he means. The Christian life consists of many things, but one element we cannot overlook is the continuing ongoing struggle to defend the faith. Defend the faith. Now, Usually, when there's a command to contend, when there's a call to fight, there are two responses in the church, eagerness and fear. There's the fighters and the lovers, right? The fighters say, bring it on, let's fight. And the lovers, who, if we're honest, are the majority of us, say, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, let's not be hasty. Throughout the history of the church, There's a tension between the people who are eager to contend and those who are anxious about contending. It's often billed as the Christians who are willing to take a stand for the truth versus the Christians who are focusing on love and forgiveness and patience. Well, the reality is that this is a false dichotomy. There's not two kinds of Christians, the fighter and the lover, The Christian faith is both. You're meant to be both. The contention that Jude demonstrates in this book consists of both of these impulses. In verses 5 through 19, he identifies and condemns false teaching. He goes to battle against the people in the church who are dangerous. And he proves to us why they are dangerous. But then at at the end of the letter... Verses 20 to 23. Let's remind ourselves of what he says. He says, But you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. And have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. These verses are describing contending for the faith. They're describing the other side of the fight. They're essential to what Jude means when he says we are to contend. Because when Jude says contend, he means identify and reject ungodliness and pursue and foster godliness. We are to love what is ungodly, hate what is ungodly, and love what is godly. It is a both and. That is what contention is. So, fighters, I praise the Lord that you love the truth. I praise the Lord that you want to stand against lies and error 
and you should do that. But season your fight with the grace and the mercy and the love of God. Don't relish the fight. The fight against false teaching is a fight of tears and of heartbreak, not of pugnacious fury. Jude describes an unfortunate necessity, not a pleasure. If you love the fight, you need to make sure that you love it because you love Christ. But lovers, those who fear the fight, which is most of us, the foundation of your love is the truth. If you say, well, we need to love, but if you don't have the truth, then there's, there, there's nothing, there's no backing. That love has no foundation. You need to stand for it. You must be willing to fight. You may not fear man, you must fear God. So your love can and should result in a calm, compassionate stand for the truth. To contend is to struggle, it's to fight, it's to grapple. Christian contention is complex because it involves the negative aspect of fighting ungodliness and the positive aspect of treasuring and fostering godliness. Do you see that? Do you see that that difference? How it comes together as one complicated act? But every battle is over something someone wants. Right? We battle because there's something we want and we don't have it. What are we contending for? What is the object of our contention? Well, Jude tells us it's the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. That's what you're fighting over. Now, that's shorthand for the gospel. It defines the gospel. When, when Jude says once for all delivered to the saints, here's what he's saying. He's saying the gospel is once for all. It's fixed. It's not open to reinterpretation or modification. It was given to us, and it is set. It was written in permanent ink. It is not to be modified. It's once for all. It's fixed, but it's delivered. It comes from God. It comes with the authority of our Creator. That's why we don't change it. It's because it's not our message, it's his message. We are stewards of it, and that's our third point. The the third thing is it's to the saints, it's to the whole church. It's our job to steward this gospel, this faith. The faith we defend is the gospel as it was originally delivered by God to all of his people. That's what we contend for. What is the gospel? The gospel is good news. And it's good news that starts with bad news. If you were here last week, Josh reminded us of the power and the wickedness of sin. The gospel starts with the truth, with the fact that you are a sinner. If you're a sinner, you deserve hell. Hell is unending constant, eternal torment because you have defied your creator. That is what we all deserve. But the gospel enters into that truth with an equal truth that God is love and that he loves sinners. Amazing love. How can it be that my God died for me, a sinner? See, God sent Christ to be a man, to experience life perfectly, and to experience the judgment of death without sin, and to be resurrected as a perfect, suitable sacrifice. Jesus earns, Jesus gives the righteousness he earned through his life and death to those who believe. So, yes, you are a sinner. But there is a free gift of righteousness available to you. And so if any man admits his sin, repents of his sin, cries out to God for forgiveness, and submits to Jesus as his Lord and Savior, he will be saved. That's the gospel. That's the good news. Now, before we go on, have you done this? Don't sit here and nod your head if in your heart you're going, maybe tomorrow. Tomorrow is the devil's day. Today is the Lord's day. 
You don't know what's happening tomorrow. I don't know what's happening tomorrow. Don't wait. There's not a moment to spare. Repent. We all must repent. But for those who have repented, we repent because the good news has broken into our lives and arrested us with the glory of Christ. If you believe the gospel, do you believe that is your only hope? And if so, can you be content to let other people mock it, confuse it, twist it, modify it, deny it? Christian, we contend for the truth, for the veracity, for the integrity of the gospel, for the faith. But faith is only as strong as its object. And that's why Jude uses the word faith is because he's pointing us to the object of the gospel. Contending for the faith for the gospel is contending for the glory of the risen Christ. Do you believe that? Contending for the glory of our Lord. Too often when we think about doctrine, when we think about heresy, we miss the forest for the trees. See, Jude's motivation, which must be our motivation, is to see the glory of Jesus Christ the Lord maintained. We don't contend because it's fun. We don't contend because we're afraid of what might happen if we don't. We contend because upholding the faith is upholding the glory of the risen Christ. If you believe the gospel, then that is what you live to do. Amen? Amen? Okay. So what is contending for the faith? When Jude writes, contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints, he means defend the glory of your Lord by struggling continually to uphold the truth of the gospel that we received from God. Defending the glory of Jesus by struggling continually to uphold the truth of the gospel as we originally received it from God. And we do this by identifying and rejecting ungodliness and by treasuring and pursuing godliness. That's contending for the faith. That's what Jude wants us to do. But the second question that we need to ask is, why contend? Why must we do this? Jude writes a whole letter telling us to do this, and we need to know why we should. Now, obviously, if you're a Christian, part of you already knows, yeah, I should do this. But these first four verses of Jude are filled with reasons why we contend. And so in Jude 1 through 4, I'm going to show you four reasons why you and I have to contend for the faith. You must contend because it is your Christian duty. You must contend because the need is urgent. You must contend because our enemy is crafty. And you must contend because your very witness is at stake. Look at verses 1 and 2, our first reason why we contend. You must contend because it is your Christian duty. Jude starts this letter as any epistle written in that time would, by identifying himself as the author. He writes, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James. Now, who is Jude? Well, Jude, in the Greek, actually, it doesn't say Jude. It says Judas. This man's name was Judas. But after Judas Iscariot betrayed Christ, we refer to faithful Judases as Jude to distinguish them. Now, Jude is Jesus' brother his half-brother. Jude is the brother of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he calls himself the brother of James. Now, why does he call himself the brother of James? The fact that he says, Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and a brother of James, just James, no last name, not explaining who James is, that tells you how influential and famous this James was. Imagine you get a phone call, and the person on the other end says, hey, this is Harry. You say... Harry, which Harry? Who? Harry who? And he says, oh, you know, William's brother. Oh, that Harry. Hello, sir. Right? All he does is reference his brother's name, and you know exactly who he's talking about. See, James in the early church was James, 
He was that James. See, John's brother, the other apostle who was James, he died very early. But Jesus, his brother James, became the leader of the church in Jerusalem. He wrote a book of the New Testament. He was well known and respected by all Christians in the apostolic church. And so Jude name drops James. That's to tell us who he is. Now you may recall that in Jesus' ministry, he preached in Nazareth. And he wasn't very popular. The people responded to his teaching. In Matthew 13, 55, they asked, Is this not the carpenter's son? Is not his mother called Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? That's who we're talking about. Which Jude are we talking about? James' brother, that Jude. This is Jesus' half-brother. Now, here's the question, right? If you were Jesus' brother, I'm willing to bet that you would probably lead with that. Right? You'd be like, hey, just so you know, Jesus is my big brother. Yeah. Yep, 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 right? That's not in here. And if you go to James, he doesn't say that either. Neither of them reference the fact that they grew up with Jesus Christ. Why not? In fact, what do they both call each other? Servant of Jesus Christ. Better translation, slave of Jesus Christ. Raise your hand if you would call yourself the slave of your older sibling. Some of you are like, that's my childhood, right? <laughs> but that's not what you do, right? You don't, that, that's, not, that's not normal. But see, slave focuses on what they see as the much more important relationship that they have with Jesus. Yes, half-brother, but slave. Slave because he is my king. He is my Lord. He is my Savior. This is a radical transformation. If you have read the Gospels, you know that during Jesus' ministry, these men did not believe in him. They did not submit to him. They thought he was crazy. But in the early church, you find them praying and worshiping. What would it take for you to worship your older sibling? Something miraculous, right? Slave of Jesus Christ is their identity. Jude is not writing as a little brother defending his big brother. He is a slave defending his master. And when he does that, you know what he does? He identifies with us. If he said, I'm Jesus' brother, we'd be like, well, all right, none of us can claim that, but we're all the slaves of Christ. And so he draws us along with him to follow him. The author of this letter is Jude, the brother of Jesus Christ, but more importantly, the slave of Jesus. Now he continues in verse 1 and 2. He says, to those who are called... Beloved in God the Father and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. So obviously this letter was written to address a specific problem. Jude wrote this to a specific people, a church, or a group of churches to address an issue that was happening within them, but we don't know those details. The letter doesn't make it clear who he's fighting, where he's sending this letter. It's general. But this works out in God's providence. One commentator writes, Jude writes broadly to all believers without distinction, so that one might view this epistle as truly a general epistle for the whole church. When God limits our understanding of the exact circumstances behind this letter, he makes it easier for us to just take it and apply the truths in it to our own situation. And that's the key. Jude writes this letter to every Christian, everywhere. That means he writes it to us, to Grace Life London. How does Jude describe his audience? How is he describing us? As we study Jude, you're going to see that he likes to use groups of three. When he describes something, he describes it three ways. He's, I mean, he's probably a preacher, right? That's what we do, right? One, two, three. Points one, two, and three. So often when he's describing things, he does it three ways. And that's exactly what he does here, these triads. He describes his audience with three passive words. They are called, loved, and kept. Called, loved, and kept. 
When he says called, he means those who have responded to the call of the gospel in repentance. Now you know that we proclaim the gospel to everyone, to every soul, but not every soul responds. So when he says called, he means it the way Paul does in 2 Timothy 1, 8 through 9. Paul writes, Therefore do not be ashamed of the testimony about our Lord, nor of me his prisoner. But share in the suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who saved us and called us to a holy calling, not because of our works, but because of his own purpose and grace, which he gave us in Christ Jesus before the ages began. This is 2 Timothy 1, 8 through 9. This is a specific term that refers to the Christian. So he says, Jude writing to Christians. And then we've got our three descriptions. So he describes the called in two ways, to be loved and kept. He says that Christians are loved in God the Father. That's not a very normal way to put it. Loved in, not loved by, loved in God the Father. And he's really referring to what we might call the doctrine of adoption or of union with Christ. We are being brought into the family of God when we are called. See, the love of God compels him to call his elect. The love of God compels him to send his son. And when we respond to the call, we are embraced and enfolded into the love of God. Christian, you live your life surrounded by, in the love of God. Wow. That's that's a unique concept. You don't see that all over the New Testament in this way. The love of God. We are in the love of God. We're also kept for Jesus Christ. Kept. Christians are gifts from the Heavenly Father to His Son. When Jesus prepared for the cross, He prayed for His people in John 17. Listen to what He says in John 17, 11. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. We see the keeping and the union there. And later in John 17, 15, Jesus continues his prayer saying, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Keep, kept, protected, held, preserved. When Jude describes us as kept for Jesus Christ, one author writes that, he offers warm assurance that in the face of grim apostasy, God will continue to keep us to the end. Now, many of us have already experienced this. Grace Life London is a church full of people who have left churches filled with weak teaching, corrupt pastoring, and twisted doctrine. Already, many of us live lives that are testimonies to God's faithfulness to keep us and preserve us and protect us from the evil one. See, those who are kept are are kept as a, a gift, a reward from God the Father to His Son for His work on the cross. Imagine with me that you, in a moment of weakness, decide to buy your child a puppy. It's so cute, you walk by it and you just say, I'm doing this, Right? And all the moms who want a puppy, don't turn to your husband right now and say, see, see, we should do it, right? But you get that puppy and you're walking home, you're like, what have I done? Oh my goodness, right? And you get home and you take the puppy out of the car and you walk inside, right? And then your kid gets home from school or later in the day, you're like, hey, I got you a puppy. You're like, where is it? You're like, oh, I don't know. I guess it, I guess puppies run away. I don't know. We lost it. Sorry, guys, no puppy, right? That's absurd, right? If you give someone a gift, you make sure that gift gets delivered in one piece, right? Well, Jesus says he calls us the people that God has given to him. You are his gift. God will keep you, not because of your own goodness and righteousness, but for the sake of his love for his son. That is the best news we can have. Christian, you will be kept. And even as we're talking about false teaching and about the church being infiltrated, we do so reminding ourselves and comforting ourselves with the truth that God will keep his own. If you're a Christian, you were called. 
You are in the love of God and you will be kept. You are the recipient of an inheritance of grace that extends beyond anything you can imagine. An enemy of God made not only a friend, but a member of the family. See, the tragedy of the Christmas truce is that it was so short-lived. It never happened again. It was a blink, a blip in history. But not so your peace with God. Your peace with God is eternal because of the Lord Jesus Christ. You've been rescued and adopted and you will be preserved, Christian, until the end. That's who he's writing to. That's, he's describing, if you are a believer, he's describing you. He's describing me. That's his audience. So why do I say that contending for the faith is a Christian duty? Well, who does Jude write to? He doesn't write to elders. He doesn't write to discernment YouTubers. He doesn't write like he does and like Paul does in 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus to a pastor or to a man who is meant to train elders. He writes to the church. He writes to all of us. And so you must contend. Whether you're 14 or much older, husband or wife, single or married, leader or disciple, you must contend. We, we all contend in different ways. The goal of this book is not that we all start some sort of ministry where we're out calling out heretics and standing up for the truth. That's not the goal of this book. The task of opposing and exposing and expelling false teachers really is the role of an elder, right? I mean, Paul makes that clear. It's a role of qualification and authority. Titus 1.9 says that an elder must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Shepherds protect the flock. They do this by equipping the flock to recognize error and falsehood and divisiveness. They do this by equipping the flock to know the truth. And they do this by identifying and expelling wolves. Again, as we said before, this isn't something that an elder or a pastor is to relish. Paul describes it in 2 Th Timothy 2, 24-25. He says, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to knowledge of the truth. This is a prayerful, hopeful ministry. That's the contending that the under-shepherds of Christ do in the church. But what about the rest of the church? You're not exempt just because you're not a leader. You're not exempt from contending just because you're not an elder. You haven't gone to seminary or you're not trained for that. The church can still identify and reject ungodliness. The church must still pursue and delight in godliness. This means we take equipping seriously. We're meant to learn self-defense, right? We need to know the truth. We need to recognize error. We need to call sin, sin. We need to call unrepentant brothers and sisters to repent. And then if things go south, the church supports the elders in the work of defending the church. You need to trust the elders' heart and motives. Think of Hebrews 13, 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls, as those will have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. This is a ministry of the whole church. It doesn't work if the elders need to defend and the flock won't allow them to. We're all meant to contend. What we're describing is unpleasant, it's unnatural, and we'd all prefer not to do it. But it's for all of us to do, and Jude knows this. And so at the end of his introduction, he offers up a prayer. Look at verse 2. May mercy, peace, and love, there's another triad, be multiplied to you. Because of the gospel, you have mercy, peace, and love from God. But Jude asks for those who need to be ready to contend that God would multiply what they already have. 
Give us more mercy. Give us more peace. Give us more love because we'll need it if we are going to stand up for the faith. This is our task, brothers and sisters. The church contends for the faith. Why contend? Because it is your Christian duty. But second, in verse 3, you must contend because the need is urgent. Listen to what Jude writes. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation... What is Jude saying here? He's saying that he didn't plan what we have right here. I like Jude. He's a planner. He's thinking ahead, right? Maybe he had an outline. Maybe he had a rough draft, right? He had spent some time on this. Do you like getting deep into a project and then having to abandon it and do something else? He's saying, I had something really good for you guys. I was really excited. I was excited to write about our common salvation. Now, common doesn't mean low class. It means shared. He's talking about the gospel. He's talking about faith. He's saying, I was planning to rejoice in the gospel in a letter meant to encourage you and uplift you and help you. But I needed to change tactics. That's what Jude says. Look at how he finishes verse 3. I found it necessary to to write appealing to you to contend for the faith. We have our purpose statement there, which we've already covered, but the surrounding language is very expressive. See, Jude is writing very clearly that his hands were tied by the situation. He did not want to change his plans. But his original letter has to become something different. Wouldn't you have loved to have that letter about our common salvation? Maybe he wrote it later, right? Maybe it existed, but God preserved this one. That should tell us something. Most of the apostles wrote many things, but God preserved what we need. This is what we have from Jude. That tells you how important this message is. See, Jude, by the direction, by the compulsion of the Holy Spirit, changes his plans. Because the issue at hand is urgent. He describes it as an appeal. He is begging his readers to pay attention to what he has to say. This isn't like a, an instruction manual. This is, this is a plea. Do your Christian duty or else. See, this is, he's telling us to do something that is clearly not what he wanted to do, and it's not what any of us want to do. It's unpleasant and unnatural, but it's not optional. <clears throat> Many things in life are like this. If you decide to have babies, they're beautiful. They're fun. They're cute. They're great. I obviously like them. But they come with late nights and nappy changes. They grow up into teenagers. Sorry, teenagers. Now, you might say, I'm not really a theology person. I don't really do all that debating and arguing. I'm just about Jesus. I just like the love part. Jude doesn't think that's okay. Jude's about the love part. That's what he was originally here to do. But contending for the faith, it might be the equivalent of leg day. right? It might be the equivalent of doing your taxes. That doesn't mean you can ignore it. It's urgent. Now Jude knows this and he leads by example. He sets aside his plan because... The gospel is at stake. He sets aside his plan because the glory of the risen Lord is threatened inside his church. The bride of Christ could betray him. There's no reflecting on our common salvation if we forfeit it. Because of the enemy we fight against, that's actually what's at stake. So this is an urgent need. So why do we contend? We contend because it's our Christian duty. We contend because the need is urgent. And then verse 4 tells us, you must contend because our enemy is crafty. He says, for certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Now, I'm not recommending them, but there's a long history of spy movies. Right? You can find 
hundreds of spy novels out there, right? We love the concept of spies, sneaky guys going behind enemy lines with their cool gadgets to infiltrate the bad guys, right? It's probably not realistic. If you could find out how to be a spy in a movie, then spies would probably be a lot easier to find, right? But spying isn't just a fun diversion. Spying didn't just get invented in the Cold War, right? Joshua sent spies into Jericho 3,000 years ago. Why? Because spies work. What does a spy do? A spy finds out your plans and tells your enemy your plans, and a spy sabotages what you're attempting to accomplish. And a good spy is unknown, so you don't know this is happening. The foundation of everything you're trying to do is threatened when there is a spy in your midst. And that means if you have a spy in your organization, the most important thing you can do is expel them at all costs, right? And that's why today countries spend millions defending themselves against espionage. Well, if Jude 3 tells us Jude's goal for the letter, Jude 4 tells us the cause. See, Jude has gotten word that his beloved friends have allowed spies into the church. The church is infiltrated. It's compromised. It's going to be, if it is not already being, attacked from within. And so it is urgent that the church take this threat seriously. Now he describes these people, as he calls them, in two ways. He said that they have crept in. One commentator writes that we should translate this, they have weaseled their way in. The idea is that they're unnoticed. No one caught them, They've just they're, they're here now. Where did they come from? We don't even know, but here they are sitting next to us, worshiping with us, fellowshipping with us. Now, good spies don't want to be caught. Good false teachers don't want to be caught. And if they're good at it, they won't be. It's not like they come in with a badge that says, I am a false teacher. If you think that you can catch them, you need to read church history. You need to consider the, even the short history of our church. It is not easy to catch divisive people. It is not easy to spot them. One pastor writes, you cannot spot a false teacher at 20 paces. You don't see him coming unless you're ready. See, Satan has been perfecting his tactics for millennia. If he wants to destroy the church, he has the upper hand because he's been working at it for a long time. They're difficult to detect. He says they have snuck in unnoticed. That's the second thing. These are unnoticed men, unnoticed people. We've missed them, he says. How did you let this happen? They're already in. If you read 2 Peter, he writes, watch out because they're coming. But Jude says, too late. They're in. You missed it. They are in the church now. It's not a warning to look out. It's a warning to root out. You need to find them. Your defenses weren't good enough. And that's one of the reasons why we're studying this. We want to be ready. We want to be, have our defenses up. We want to have our guard up in a godly way. Because the thing is, these men were unnoticed, but they didn't need to be. Because Jude describes them as designated for this destruction long ago. This is a weird phrase. If you read this and you're doing your inductive Bible study, you probably wrote a question mark by it, and that'd be good, because it's kind of awkwardly phrased. Designated for this destruction long ago. What does Jude mean? Well, long ago can mean a few hours or a few hundred years. And God has identified what we should be looking for. Jude is saying Israel's history, church history, scripture is full of examples and warnings and means to identify these exact people among the people of God. He's saying if you know the word, if you know the history of God's people, these people, are you're able to identify them. He's saying the church has people inside it who are already condemned by God's revealed will. And that's a big problem. Now Jude's going to prove his point. In verses 5 through 19, he just goes through church history and scripture. He just shows this is what bad guys do. 
and here's how they're doing it. And this is what bad guys do, and here's how they're doing it. He proves that there was ample warning, ample evidence, ample preparation that God has offered through his word that they missed. This is no light matter. This is not something to excuse. Listen to how John MacArthur describes this kind of threat. He says, The deadliest false teaching comes not from deceptive non-Christian religions outside the church, but from spiritual pretenders inside the church. And the resulting damage is far greater than that caused by an external assault because the casualties are spiritual and the consequences are eternal. This is scary, right? Judas saying, they're here and you missed it and you didn't need to miss it. But you weren't ready. And now they're, they're inside. And that means they can destroy everything. This is urgent. The enemy is crafty. This is your duty. So the final way, the final reason why we have to contend is because our witness is at stake. See, in the second part of verse 4, Jude actually describes these enemies. He says, They are ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. See, Jude creates a contrast. Remember, he said the called... We share a salvation, we share a faith, we share a God, we share a master and Lord. And then he says there are these people. These people are outside the camp. They are not a part of the church. They're in the church, but they're not of the church. He's got another triad here. Remember, he pronounced Christians as called, loved, and kept. But false Christians are ungodly, perverse deniers of Christ. If you were to summarize These false brethren with one word, it would be ungodly. This word means devoid of all reverence for God. These men have no desire to honor God. They can talk the talk, but they're deceptive. They're completely opposed to God. Now, there are always unbelievers in the church. There are always people who don't believe the gospel who are in God's church, and that is a good thing. Because the church, we're proclaiming the gospel, we're celebrating the good news, and we want unbelievers to hear the good news. If you're an unbeliever and you're here, you are welcome. It's good. We believe that the words of eternal life come from this book, and that's why we proclaim them, and we want people who don't believe them here. But these men aren't unbelievers, They aren't just unbelievers. They're unbelievers who want to twist and destroy and maim the church. They want to steal Christ's bride. They're like the shepherds who come in, the under shepherds who come in and and allow the sheep to be stolen. We must be willing and able to identify and reject this kind of man. These people are ungodly. And then Jude defines this ungodliness with two clauses. First, he says, they pervert the grace of our God into sensuality. Sensuality is gross wickedness and immorality. What he says is these men are taking the grace of God to justify the very things that Jesus died for. These men, if they heard Romans 6.1, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may abound? These men would say yes. They would say yes. This is antinomianism. This is rejecting of God's moral standard in the name of God's grace. Jude is outraged. He's saying these men have taken the blood of Christ and used it to permit that which he hates. Are you outraged by that? Does the thought of that make you sick? Jude is trying to communicate his fury that this would happen in the church. Josh taught us the horrors of sin last week. Friends, when we permit sin, we spit on the cross. We declare that the blood of Christ, the only remedy for sin, is worthless. 
If Jesus is truly your Lord, then you hate this. You must hate this. They pervert the grace of God into sensuality. And when when they do this, it only ends in one thing. Jude says that second, they deny our only Lord and Master, Jesus Christ. He says our. Remember, Jude is one of us. He's saying, this is our Lord. This is our Master. They've denied Him and they're in us, with us now. A faithful servant is indignant when his master is dishonored. How does this dishonor Christ? Well, no grace means we don't need Jesus. No Jesus means there's no Christianity. That's why he contrasts these people with the called, their false teachers or their false brethren. They they didn't necessarily come in and try to teach this different heresy. They weren't necessarily getting up on Sunday and preaching a different Gospel, what they were doing was living a life that proved that Jesus was not their Lord. Our lifestyle proves what we really believe. They could articulate truth, so much so that they were accepted in the church. They were so well accepted that they could sit down at a love feast and not fear. They could be totally relaxed and be themselves. They're not watching what they say. They're not being careful because they're so well accepted. But their lifestyles reveal that they're spiritually bankrupt. If you truly believe the gospel, you live a transformed life. Now remember, we're not starting a heretic hunt. We shouldn't be looking at your neighbors going, is it you? But we should examine ourselves. Can you look at your life and see the fruit of the Holy Spirit? Yeah, I know you know what to say on Sunday after the sermon and at fellowship group. We figured out the Christian lingo, right? But would you want us following you home and watching the way you live? If you knew that one of the brothers or sisters from the church was following you on social media, or worse, that one of the pastors was following you on social media, would you change what you post? We cannot be ungodly and profess Christ, brothers and sisters. There's no greater oxymoron in the earth. It's a contradiction. Do not think you can be a Christian and live in rebellion. Why is this such a problem? Why is Jude so anxious to write this letter? Because if a church permits ungodly people to pervert grace and deny the lordship of Christ, then that church forfeits its effectiveness. That church becomes useless. A church which perverts grace and denies the lordship of Christ is not a church. It's a gathering, but it's not defended by Christ. It's an imposter. It's an apostate. It's a source of confusion and peril for everyone who enters in. If you're not teaching the truth and someone comes in, you're not giving them the gospel. You're giving them what they want to hear. See, the world perverts grace. The world denies Christ. So if a church becomes the world, it's useless. Friends, if our church becomes a haven, if it becomes a safe space for false brethren, then we forfeit our testimony. This church doesn't exist to make you feel good. It does not exist to comfort you to make you happy, to give you help. All those things can and will happen when we are faithful to our mission, which is this, to proclaim the glorious gospel of the risen Jesus Christ, our Lord and our King. Grace Life London exists because Jesus is risen. We exist because the world needs to know and needs to worship their King. If we don't contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints, if we don't reject ungodliness and pursue godliness, we forfeit our testimony. You can bet that the kind of people who infiltrate the church, their first and main target is Jesus Christ. It is the grace of Christ. And if they can pervert and deny that, then the church has been lost. The church fails to glorify Christ. The church becomes useless to her master. 
and Satan rejoices. See, Jude wrote this letter, and he wrote it in a way that we can now take it and apply it to our own church, to our own situation, because our witness is at stake. Do you believe that? Do you see it? Our duty is to contend for the faith. We must defend the glory of our Lord Jesus by struggling continually to uphold the truth of the gospel as we originally received it from God. We do this by identifying and rejecting deception and ungodliness, and by treasuring the truth, by treasuring godliness. Why do we do this? Because contending for the faith is our duty. Because contending for the faith, the need is urgent. Because our enemies are crafty. And because if they succeed, we will lose our witness. Praise the Lord that he is growing this church. Praise the Lord that we are experiencing his grace. That he is maturing us. We should rejoice in that. We should relish that. But we need to remember that there's no Christmas truce in the battle against Satan. He does not rest and the war wages on. Our life is many things, but part of it is the constant wrestling match against Satan, against the world, against our flesh, as long as we live. It's a long battle. But we don't despair. Because, remember, friends, the victory is already won. Satan rages because he is already defeated. Everything we experience from him is his final thrashing, his death throw as he awaits his condemnation. Because our king will return. And he will end the battle and true, lasting, eternal peace will reign. One day, none of us is going to be contending anymore. Jude concludes his letter with these precious words. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. See, your hope is that God will keep you and one day present you to your Savior. So set your eyes on that hope and contend, Christian. Oh, church, contend for the faith, for the truth, for the love of your brothers and sisters, for the love of the lost, and for your love for your glorious King and Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise the name of Jesus who willingly came to sacrifice himself on our behalf. And he saved us to be a church that would proclaim his glory to the nations. Lord, we relish the thought of your eventual victory over Satan and sin and death. We thank you that one day the battle will be over and peace will reign. But Lord, as we wait, we ask that you would strengthen us. We ask that you would help us to take your truth seriously. Help us to struggle for the truth of the gospel. Help us to make sure that it is not confused, that it is not changed, modified, reinterpreted in our church. We love your word and we preach it, but that does not mean that we are immune from the attacks of the evil one. So make us humble and make us eager to stand firm. Lord, protect us. We want to be useful. We do not want to forfeit our testimony. We want to see this city and this country reached by the good news of our Lord. So Lord, help us and strengthen us. 
Bless us as we study this book so that we can be ready and be equipped. We pray these things so that you would be glorified. In the name of your Son, Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.